Hello again, here's Richard Node from the University of Ottawa and in this lecture I want to talk about spike timing and plasticity. Plasticity. When two neurons are connected, the connection strength is plastic, meaning that it is malleable, it can be sculpted, it can be altered. Altered by what? Well, many experiments have shown that if you stimulate neurons on both sides of the synapse, you may alter the effect of a spike arriving on the postsynaptic cell. Synaptic plasticity is often described by saying what fires together, wires together. But does that mean what spikes together, wires together? How is plasticity orchestrated? when the communication is based on spikes with precise timing. To talk about plasticity, we need to talk about synaptic weights. A weight is a metric for the connection strength. When a presynaptic cell fires an action potential, it creates a postsynaptic current, and the amplitude of the postsynaptic current is what we call the synaptic weight. Now, if we make some type of plasticity protocol, we make the presynaptic and postsynaptic neuron fire, this postsynaptic current, when we trigger the presynaptic cell again, might, say, increase. If it increases, such as shown here, we call this long-term potentiation, or potentiation, simply. If it decreases, not shown here, we call that long-term depression, LTD. Experimental studies have shown that there are multiple factors that influence whether we see LTP or LTD. Relative timing is an important one. When the presynaptic neuron fires an action potential before the postsynaptic neuron, such as it could have been causing the postsynaptic neuron to fire, then we see potentiation. When it's the reverse, when it's the postsynaptic neuron that fires before, we typically see LTD depression, such as shown here. Neuromodulation is another very important factor. No matter what type of electrical activity we have on both sides of the synapse, we can go from LTD to LTP by changing the relative concentration of neuromodulators that are deployed at the synapse. These neuromodulators are serotonin, acetylcholine, and dopamine. And another factor is the firing pattern. For instance, when we pair a presynaptic spike with a postsynaptic single spike, we typically get LTD. But when we pair a presynaptic spike with a postsynaptic burst, we typically get LTP. So by simply changing the firing pattern on the postsynaptic neuron, we can alter the type of plasticity. Now, in this lecture, I will focus on relative timing. Our knowledge of plasticity due to relative timing comes from experiments that look like this. We pair a train of action potential stimulated in the presynaptic neuron and a train of action potential with a postsynaptic neuron, and we control the relative timing between the pre and the post spikes. And then we measure the synaptic weight, and we see then that when post precedes pre, we get LTD, and that when pre precedes post, we get LTP. That's very nice, and it's, pre it's quite convincing. However, if we're trying to use this feature in simulations and see what it does, well, our simulations will not take the form of these very regular 
spikes. Instead, the spike timing will be rather random, such as we see in vivo when we look at spike trains. So how should the synaptic strength W evolve? How should we change this W? Should we actually look at the nearest neighbors and compute some type of relative timing? Or should we actually take triplet interaction? How should we go about doing this? The approach that is typically taken is to use traces, presynaptic traces and postsynaptic traces. This is thought to reflect that many processes in biology are involving um, a sudden change followed by a linear dynamics that, that give you the trace. For instance, a presynaptic trace is thought to be an activation of a metabotropic receptor on the postsynaptic membrane such that whenever a presynaptic spike arrives, the trace for that particular neuron I increases and then decays with linear dynamics to its stationary point. We can control the amplitude of that increase with a parameter A+. Conversely, we have a postsynaptic trace. Whenever a postsynaptic spike is emitted, there, the action potential is backpropagating to the location of the synapse and this leaves a trace that may look like this. Whenever we have a postsynaptic spike, we have a jump and then linear dynamics back to a stationary point. Here we'll choose the jump to be negative and control this with a parameter A- minus, and we call the trace M. In this way, if each presynaptic spike will change the weight according to the postsynaptic trace, like this, each presynaptic spike is looking at the postsynaptic trace and reads it off. Here it's zero, so no change in weights. But here, when there's a presynaptic spike, I have a negative value, another negative value, so I decrease the synaptic weight. And this can be written here as reading off M, the postsynaptic trace, at the time of the presynaptic spike. And we make that proportional to the weight um, so that we, and we have a multiplicative change. The postsynaptic spike will also incur a change of the weights. And each time we have a postsynaptic spike, we read off of the presynaptic trace, like this. This way, we really capture the relative timing. In this case, whenever the postsynaptic spike comes when the presynaptic trace is elevated, we will increase the weights. And this way we get LTP whenever pre precedes post, and we get LTD whenever post precedes pre. And we can create this sort of coincidence window where the change in weights will be LTP whenever pre precedes post, but that magnitude of the potentiation would depend on the precise timing and this decay here is controlled by the decay of the postsynaptic trace or the presynaptic trace and is another parameter that is chosen to be 20 milliseconds to match experiments. The amplitude here will be controlled by A plus and the amplitude here of the depression will be controlled by A minus. But we're not finished. Connection strengths cannot keep on increasing forever. And similarly, they cannot decrease and then become negative because neurons do not go from being excitatory to suddenly become inhibitory. So we need to impose bounds on the dynamics of the synaptic weights. 
the way that we use to do so matters quite a bit. Now here I just chose one particular example where whenever we are changing upon a presynaptic spike, instead of increasing to an infinite bound, we will compare the increase that we wanted to take with some upper bound here, one, and take the minimum value of the two, such that we cannot increase the synaptic weight further. Similarly, when a postsynaptic spike comes and we would normally implement some depression, we will take the maximum value between what we'd like to do according to the synaptic traces and zero. This way we're bound between zero and one. Now let's explore what this sort of spike timing dependent plasticity does. Imagine a thousand excitatory neurons firing random spikes at a fixed presynaptic firing rate and 200 inhibitory neurons that are also firing at a fixed presynaptic firing rate. Only the synapses of the excitatory neurons are plastic, are allowed to change. And the postsynaptic neuron will fire in response to all this activity. So the presynaptic activity will look fairly random. And if we don't choose the synaptic weights here to be strong enough, we won't be able to drive the postsynaptic neuron to fire, and there will be no pair, no pairs to speak of, and there will be no plasticity, and the system will just remain silent. So there's no pre and post coincidence, no plasticity, and neurons remain silent. If instead we start the simulation with stronger connections, such that the postsynaptic neuron is active. Then we're typically in a case where there's quite a lot of current flowing through and the postsynaptic neuron is in this mean driven regime and fires quite regular action potentials. And it's not locked to any particular firings in the presynaptic cells. So we can consider the association between pre and post to be random. So regular firing means that we're sampling randomly from this coincidence window. So if there's just as much LTP as there is LTD, we should get no net changes in the synaptic weights. But if we choose that there is a net depression, that allows the system to do some type of self-organization. And it's quite interesting. The synaptic weight will give net depression. It will reduce the net drive to the neurons. So let me explain this in more detail. Imagine the net excitatory current. So the net current flowing through all the excitatory synapses. And the net inhibitory current the net current flowing through all the inhibitory synapses. At the beginning of the simulation, as I said, excitation is a little bit strong, so it outweighs the inhibition. Overall, these two combine and give a net potential that is above the firing threshold. In this situation, the neurons are firing regularly, and we are sampling randomly from the coincidence window. The net depression will drive the excitation down such that we get at one point where there's a balance between excitation and inhibition. Their fluctuations are combining and only a positive fluctuation is reaching the firing threshold. We're now in the fluctuation driven regime and spiking is irregular. What's particularly, particularly nice is that this is a stable point. The plasticity rules are such that it won't go further down without being brought back up. And we stay in that irregular regime. So to summarize, when we initialize the system at a point where it's outweighed by excitation, we get regular firing, 
random sampling on the pre-post timing on the plasticity window, net depression, and irregular firing, an irregular firing that looks a lot like what we see from cells in vivo. And this is a surprisingly robust phenomenon. We can try the same thing starting the simulation with different presynaptic excitatory rate. We plot here the postsynaptic rate against the presynaptic constant rate, and we see that, of course, the postsynaptic rate is scaling up, but much weaker than the slope of one. So it's actually a very weak coupling. Um, this is accompanied, most importantly, by a CV that is very high at the end of the simulation and doesn't depend on whether we start at a high presynaptic rate or a low presynaptic rate. This is due to a balance between excitation and inhibition, as seen here um, by looking at the ratio of inhibition over excitation. So this is one very nice, more homeostatic type of uh, function of this spike timing dependent plasticity. You'll see also in the tutorial that the same learning rule can allow neurons to pick up which of the inputs are correlated with the output. Um, and I should mention also that this is not the only way with which neuron are keeping into this uh, balance regime and there are other mechanisms that can lead neurons for doing that, for instance, the plasticity of inhibitory cells. So in the exercise, you'll be able to simulate a model of spike timing dependent plasticity. You'll be able to observe how this model leads to a self-stabilization of the different types of synapses that are impinging on the neuron. That is, the excitation is balancing the inhibition. You'll also be able to observe how the synaptic weights will depend on the level of correlation between the input and the output. And so if you're interested in knowing more about this, I've assembled textbooks and papers here and see ya.